Human Development I was at a Memorial Day barbecue in the mission, barely drinking, but using my cold beer as an excuse for belligerence, screaming about the math prodigy from our freshman dorm who had been, and probably still was, a white predator of Asian women. It needs to be said. I shouted as half of the gay kickball team scowled at me from the beer pong table. The only difference between college and adulthood was that my peers could now afford custom tables built for drinking games. We were three years out of Stanford, most of us clinging to the Bay Area, and I was the only one not working in tech, and thus the only one without tech money. My life was also pathetically devoid of tech-catered lunches, tech laundry services, tech Wi-Fi commuter buses, tech holiday bonuses, tech personalized yoga sessions, tech subsidized gym memberships at Equinox, tech health and dental insurance and unlimited tech PTO, and of course those tech company t-shirts and hoodies that never fit well on anyone, unless the CEO had sprung for a corporate partnership with Lululemon or Patagonia. Not that I felt left out, though I should have, given the state of my bank account. My job was to teach rich kids with fake Adderall prescriptions how to be socially conscious at a private high school in Marin. The Frank Chin Chin Endowed Teaching Fellow for Diversity, that was the official title for my two-year-long position, of which I had just finished the first, and the class I taught for the service learning department was called Human Development. To my knowledge, this kind of indoctrination existed exclusively at the most elite of private high schools, the ones whose names started with a capitalized the and ended with a capitalized school, as if only the wealthy possessed a real capacity to develop. Most days I tried to forget that my salary was less than a year's tuition, which many of my students paid for through their trust funds. Summer break had just started, and I wasn't even tutoring, though I needed the extra cash, and probably the social interaction. Still, the concept of high school tuition made me sick. Why the fuck would you say something like that? Asked my twin sister's friend, the one who'd invited me to the party, and who was, among other things, a Taiwanese woman working at Google. Give us a trigger warning next time, Anthony Jesus. Why's the goal of this party to reclaim the culture of closeted fret brothers? I snapped to make sure she registered my intention of tanking the enterprise of our conversation. My sister's friend scowled at me. Why'd you even come tonight? She asked with contempt. You look like you haven't slept in days. Absent an answer, I chugged the rest of my beer. I was in a bad mood. The entire afternoon, I had already wasted trying to overhaul my human development class for the upcoming school year. My plan was to abandon the glib lessons on microaggressions, the cringy videos of teenagers role-playing scenes of consent, the PowerPoints that neutered big political issues into handy vocabulary terms everything that was deemed by the social learning department, which was hilariously Caucasian, as fundamental yet yet appropriate. After a lacrosse player in my previous class had equated using the N-word to the tone of liberals saying conservative voter, I decided that high school sophomores would learn more about being decent humans by reading Moby Dick. I felt very serious about this new direction for my pedagogy as the Frank Chin Endowed Teaching Fellow for Diversity, so serious that I was altering the established curriculum without informing my white woman boss. Yet I couldn't bring myself to do the work. I hadn't even started rereading Moby Dick. Five beers later, I was sitting on the couch next to a mob of back-end engineers, all of them wasted, lurid in their stated heterosexuality, and deep into a Super Smash Brothers tournament. I texted my sister, this party's in the gay capital of the world and straight inkels are playing video games. I waited for a reply until I remembered New York City was three hours ahead. I texted her again. Still can't believe you left SF you asshole. Then I actually got drunk and yelled at a former philosophy classmate. An ex-co-op dude with bleached hair and mediocre stick ampokes, he had sold out to become a technical writer for Palantir because his parents had stopped paying his rent. Nobody wanted to hear him talk about Hannah Arendt, I kept asserting, with aggression, to him and his VC consultant girlfriend. I actually loved discussing Arendt she was the topic of my senior honors thesis, but I was too drunk to recall that. When my former classmate began reciting the first sentence of the human condition, I muttered something about needing ketamine to disassociate from his very existence, then returned to the couch and scrolled through Grinder, blocking the profiles of every kick 
kickball player who was at the party. It was a political statement, not a sexual preference, and regret punched me in the dick when I looked up and realized the guy I just blocked was also on his phone, staring directly at me, disappointment slapped across his face. He was hotter in person too, with broad shoulders, tan skin from all the kickball, but I got over it. I felt like bottoming. And didn't feel like being a hypocrite by letting a white predator colonize my rectum. It took real intuition and finagling to sift through the preponderance of white on white on white on white profiles the white muscle daddies and sparkling white twinks, the white otters and white gamers, the white gym rats trying to sell steroids to Dowie white tech brothers. What can I say, I chose $6 lattes over the premium fee that empowered gay racists to segregate their sex lives. I messaged 10 profiles of color in a row with some combination of hey, an emoji, and a few nudes, so they could see I was decently attractive from more than one angle. One Asian guy replied immediately, Hey, I'm also Khmer. Can't believe I found you on this app. You know only 0.0009% of America is a gay Khmer man. Hope we're not cousins cause you're cute as fuck. Beer rushed up and seared my throat, producing a painful burp. I had forgotten writing I'm Cambodian in my profile, so that guys would stop asking me what I am. Forgot because guys never read my profile anyway, and still dragged me into ethnicity guessing games all the time, as though our grinder messages were a trivia night hosted at a previously hip bar. People of all races, even other Asian men, thought my exact ethnic composition impressed a specific bearing on the way I handled a penis. I reread the message and cringed, then Instagram stalked his photos to make sure none of my family members were featured. Ben Lam, he was called, his haircut looking expensive, bone structure chiseled. He was manicured and presentable, presentable, wearing tight-fitting clothes in every photo Christ even his bedroom selfies. Like many Cambodian people in the Bay Area, he was from my hometown in the valley not Silicon Valley, I should make clear, but the insufferably hot and arid one two hours east. We appeared to have zero blood relation. That was good. Though at 45 two decades older than me he looked young the way older gay men do when they hit the gym twice a day, seven days a week, with monomaniacal drive. Hoping I wasn't taller than him, that he was at least 5'10", I messaged back, can you host? 30 minutes later, I was riding the 14 bus down Mission Street and into Soma, staring out the window, and trying to ignore the gay couple in a screaming match. One of them had broken the rules of their open relationship by sleeping with the other's ex. It sucked that my budget had absolutely no leeway for taking Uber pools to my hookups. As the sidewalks transitioned from trendy restaurants to homeless encampments to glassy corporate lobbies, I tried to remember the point in the night when I decided to have sex. Mostly, I didn't want to mope around my apartment, where I would lie awake doing nothing because my internet was too slow to stream anything the Filipino guy who'd moved into my sister's room having crippled the apartment's Wi-Fi with his online gaming. It appalled me that he paid San Francisco rent only to play video games all day and night, every goddamn weekend, and never go outside. Ben lived in a luxury apartment complex, the kind with amenities, with doormen, a saltwater pool even, according to the billboard outside, and he answered the door in nothing but sharp white briefs. Unsure if he was trying to be sexy, I greeted him with a one-armed side hug. We were the exact same size and height, only my muscles had a normal-looking density. I'm glad you came, he said. What's your name? Your profile didn't say. Can I get some water? I asked, dizzy and ignoring his question. He pointed into a room. Sure. Just wait for me there. You can sit on the bed. After hydrating, we kissed until I pushed Ben down, straddled his body, and asked if he wanted to fuck me. Sure, of course, he said, so after struggling a bit with the condom wrapper he insisted on the protection we covered his dick with latex and lube. Then, as I eased him into my body, I let out a soft, involuntary moan, which startled him into a look of cautious bewilderment, as though he'd just received praise after worrying he'd been doing less than a good job. His apparent inexperience suddenly made me feel inexperienced, too, but our energy was good, intimate even, and we settled into a natural, fumbling rhythm. I'm not sure if that look ever quit his face, 
because we ended up in some version of doggy style. He had wanted to do missionary, but seemed oblivious to the differences between heterosexual missionary and for lack of a better term gay hookup missionary. When he pulled out and unwrapped his dick, he asked me where I wanted him to finish, and I told him wherever he wanted, except I wasn't in the mood for swallowing. It wasn't long before a jet of lukewarm semen landed across my back, and he collapsed on top of me. For a second our bodies were like a grilled cheese sandwich glued together with not quite enough cheese. Rolling off me, he landed in the bed, then caressed my back. I didn't know how to transition into this new dynamic, felt awkward that we weren't still having sex. It seemed bizarre now to launch into conversation, to interact by sharing biogra biographical facts rather than saliva, semen, and touch. He was Cambodian from the shittier valley. Same as me. What else, really, did I need to know? What are you up to tomorrow? He asked, his right leg thrown over me, along with an arm. I'm gonna walk the Golden Gate Bridge with some friends. An earthquake can send the bridge right into the bay, I answered, and I wouldn't care, not at all. He looked at me with confusion, his silence conveying total uncertainty in how to respond, so I laughed to make sure he knew I was mostly joking. It was a laugh I often forced when dealing with students. This triggered a laugh of relief from him. What did the Golden Gate Bridge ever do to you? He finally asked. Surprised by his response, that he was invested in my reasoning, I laughed again, genuinely this time. Usually people dismissed my contempt for the biggest tourist attraction of the Bay Area. During the school year I commute across it. The sights get old, real quick. That would do it. Let's do this again, I found myself saying. My name is Anthony, by the way. He smiled and kissed me before leaving the bed to take a piss. I took the time to make sure the sheets weren't stained by by cum or shit. I wanted to keep things feeling clean. The next three days I slept at Ben's place. Something about submitting to his body, the permanent newness of his luxury apartment, and the beginning of June, it all knocked me into a kind of productivity. Every morning I walked to my regular coffee shop and read Moby Dick, marking up passages I could teach, until the late afternoon, or until Ben texted me to come back, whichever came first. It felt nice, in Ben's clean clothes, to become reacquainted with Moby Dick. It was the first novel I'd ever read that didn't care for resolutions. It validated for me the experience of confusion, of exploring something as stupid and vast as a white whale, as an ocean. Or, at least, it made me feel okay about the philosophy major I'd settled on after failing all my classes in chemistry, first, and then economics. Equipping teenagers to sniff out the nonsense of society, I told myself, that was the logic behind this new curriculum. I wanted my students to understand the doomed nature of Ahab's hunt for Moby Dick, the profound calm of Ishmael's aimless wandering, the difference between having purpose, like Ahab, and finding meaning, like Ishmael. I thought my students should learn the best ways to be lost. The morning I finally took the Muni back to my inner sunset apartment, my regular coffee shop was booked for a networking mixer targeted at single coders. I was pissed off by the mixer because stickers reading queers hate T-E-C-H-I-E-S were pasted all over the bathroom. The pointless stickers had previously made me laugh because every radicalized gay guy I knew worked for Apple as a UX designer, but now, seeing this mixer, I became furious at the man management for leaving them up without committing to their politics, or, hell, even just the aesthetic. In terms of San Francisco subcultures, the coffee shop was trying to have its cake and eat it too, and I texted my sister that the place was dead to me. Then, for good measure, I sent her a picture of Ben, dubbed the first Cambodian guy to fuck me. By the time I reached my apartment, my sister had thoroughly interrogated me about Ben about the minutiae of his life that couldn't be gathered from a straight statistical analysis of his LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram accounts. I told her what I knew, that Ben was a recent online MBA grad and a late bloomer who'd started living as openly gay in his late 30s. He had moved to San Francisco to network with venture capitalists, after taking care of his mom until she died of a diabetes-related stroke which was part of why he'd been such a closet case. These days he was living off life insurance money, 
freelance database coding gigs, and renting out his dead mom's house on Airbnb. My sister texted me, he sounds like a guy mom would arrange marry to me. I texted back, yeah he's low-key infuriating, but his apartment has working Wi-Fi. She responded, lol, still using sex for free shit. Glad to know you haven't changed. My sister never commented on the fact that Ben was Cambodian, or that he was almost twice my age, though she was probably used to my flings with older men my daddy phase hit hard in college, when I'd loathed everyone our age even more than I did now. Still, I felt a pang of resentment toward her, her for not acknowledging the strangeness, the idiotic sadness, of my finding a Cambodian dude to fuck me a decade too late, long after I'd stopped fantasizing about the perfect boyfriend who would just get me. I texted, I hate everyone, quit your job and move back. She answered, stop being dramatic, you're the Frank Chin endowed teaching fellow for diversity. Also, fucking shit, I love my new job. Back in my own apartment, I lay in my bed, surrounded by stacks of dusty books from college. All these classic stories and groundbreaking theories I was too lazy to throw out or even organize. The next big earthquake fuck, even a door slammed too hard would have buried me in a mountain of recorded thought no one gave a shit about anymore. I stared at the ceiling while my sister texted me about the eccentric new boss who'd convinced everyone on her marketing team to do a juice cleanse, about the unmatched congeniality of her co-workers, the shocking number of employees who also happened to be women of color, how every other Thursday the company rented out an entire bar for happy hour, even though their office kitchen was stocked with craft beer on tap. It had been totally worth the semi-permanent dislocation, this dream job of hers. I waited for her to ask me when I was applying to grad school, if I'd signed up for the GRE yet, as she'd done every week since we graduated from Stanford, but she only went on about her job. Sounds like you're having a great time, I texted, before falling asleep and waking up to another wasted day. Several days later, after Ben learned that I was subsisting primarily on coffee shop bagels, he started cooking me dinner. Dinner. It's the least I can do, he said to me on his bed. When I told him I didn't need to be fed, he held me close, nuzzled my neck, let me feel how hard he was even though we just had sex. Where he got so much energy in bed, in work, in life remained a mystery to me. Could I actually be the thing exciting him, I thought, skeptical and semi-repulsed, even as a warm buzz settled in my chest. I inched even closer to him, and his arms tightened around me to the point of impracticality. I wanted his hot breath all over my entire body. Dressed only in our underwear, Ben and I relocated to the kitchen. The modern style of the apartment, with its platinum surfaces and minimalist furnishings, struck me as clinical when populated by our bare bodies, like we were test subjects in some well-financed medical study. Isn't life great? Ben said, chopping some chili peppers. I mean, look at this view. With the knife still in his hand, he pointed at the single window that stretched across an entire wall, the view obling the Bay Bridge, the expanse of water it crossed, all the opportunity bursting from the iron seams of that wide span. Yeah, I think the view from my apartment is just this building, I said from the dining table. Ben laughed. He was intent on finding the underbelly of positivity lurking beneath everything I said. How do you not have a boyfriend? Boys can't handle me, I said flippantly. He smiled in response and part of me felt tender, too much so, my insides exposed to the air. I had the perverse desire to test the limits of his optimism. We ate a traditional Cambodian meal that Ben had altered to be healthy. Be healthy. He squirted raw honey into the coconut milk instead of adding sugar, sheared the extraneous fat off the pork belly, and swapped the white rice for cauliflower smashed into bits. The dish tasted good. The essential ingredients were there the spices, the fermented fish, the lemongrass. But it looked disfigured, like it had been extinct and was then genetically resurrected in a petri dish. I want to know everything about you, Ben said. I'll show you my LinkedIn page if you want, I said, chewing flavors mutated from my childhood. You like the Prahok? He asked. One of my aspirations is to disrupt the Khmer food industry with organic modifications. Hearing a man with 4% body fat talk about health, in tech speak, using disrupt without sarcasm, 
all in his underwear, it made my head hurt. I want to curate a series of online video recipes that lay out well-balanced diets for Khmer folk, he continued. See, my mom died from diabetes. And most Khmer folk have no idea white rice is unhealthy. It's basically sugar. I'd pay 20 bucks for this, I said, taking another bite for emphasis. Come modifying his work seemed to please him. So that's the app you're working on. Healthy Khmer food? No, no, he said, as if brushing off an overzealous compliment. That's more like the 10-year goal versus, say, the 5-year goal. He said goal with the same intonation as my sister, with the complete confidence that donning a growth mindset was undeniably a virtue. My sister could go on and on about her life plan MBA from Wharton, Forbes 30 under 30, three kids before she turned 40 to the point that my own meandering life had become a casualty of hers. Halfway through college, after I'd proved incapable of handling my own education, she started mapping both of our career goals on a shared Excel spreadsheet. She would be the CFO and CEO of her own marketing analytics firm, I would become an Ivy League professor in philosophy. Our whole lives we'd been geniuses, role models, twins destined for greatness. We were the only kids in our neighborhood, basically the only Cambodians in general, to make it as far as Stanford, and my sister was intent on maximizing this potential. She kept the two of us elevated in a stratosphere of legible success, with internships and research opportunities anything to prevent us from falling to our old lives, to the poverty shackling almost 30% of Cambodian Americans, a statistic that she readily cited in all her job interviews, making sure to note that it was more than twice the national rate. As for the goals she projected for my future, it had been a while since I checked our spreadsheet, not since she moved to New York anyway, and the thought of it left me exhausted. So you want to hear my pitch? Ben asked. He'd finished eating and was holding his stomach with his hands, as if measuring how many calories he would need to burn during his next, next workout session. Sure, I said. But if you ask me to sign an NDA, I swear to fucking God I'm leaving. In my underwear and everything. Ha. Ha. Don't worry, I trust you enough, he said, and I cringed without his noticing. Okay, so you know what cruising is, right? I furrowed my eyebrows. I'll take that as a yes, he said in what sounded like a rehearsed voice. So one day while I was, you know, looking, it dawned on me, why can't we take the idea of cruising of seeking intimate connections that are marginalized by the public and apply it to other aspects of our society, you know. And, specifically, to the lives of those hidden from the mainstream. He paused for dramatic effect, spreading his arms wide in a controlled movement. How often do you walk through life wishing for a space you can immediately feel at ease in? Right. Imagine filtering through profiles of people who share similar identifying factors with you. People only a message away from becoming a new point of cultural connection. Imagine using the technology of Grinder, Scruff, Growler for building a new community, a new future. My app seeks to forge pathways between individuals and safe spaces through a cutting-edge algorithm and a network of thoroughly screened members. Think of it as a digital interface that allows people of color, people with disabilities, people identifying as LGBTQ, to cruise for safe spaces spaces not specifically for sex, but for the whole of their lives. He finished and stared at me. The whole time he was speaking I'd done my best to project that I was taking him, and his idea, seriously. And it wasn't even like I thought Ben's app, app was unfeasible. After my freshman year roommate received a million in VC funding, for a fucking dog walking app, I stopped judging people's startup ideas in terms of their viability for success in the field. He just and I tried, really I did, not to care sounded like a clueless kid during his pitch, like he'd learned something new at school, and was now obsessed with talking about it. Buzzwords rolled off his tongue as naturally as a robot trying to act human LGBTQ, people of color, safe space. So what do you think? He pressed. Pretty awesome, right? Being able to find Khmer folk wherever you are, whenever you want? I forced a smile. Sounds like a cool idea. Something in our chemistry and the way I saw him shifted after Ben explained his app to me. 
When he cooked extravagant meals, I felt guilty because, honestly, it would have made zero difference to me if we ate frozen pizzas instead of his thoughtful culinary creations. He had this notion that I always wanted to eat Cambodian food, as if it provided some critical nourishment to my soul. Doesn't it feel good to eat what we're supposed to be eating? He'd ask, and I'd nod, wondering how long he was going to last as a worthwhile distraction. And then our sex became more how to say this, more deliberate. Thrusting into me, he'd fix upon me intently with his eyes, with an unwavering sympathy, without breaking his gaze, and ask if he was hurting me, even when I was penetrated by all of two fingers. I would have preferred him to be rougher, of course. Sometimes though, I was completely disoriented by how comfortable I felt in his presence, how easily shocks ran up and down my spine as he fucked me. A few weeks passed and I realized my only social interactions now involved Ben. He spent his days having phone conversations with all kinds of different startup employees, reading articles about diversifying Silicon Valley with more brown faces, as if that brownness could make the whole tech industry any less absurd, grotesque, and frivolous. About six hours of his day he dedicated to vigorous typing as he stared into his laptop the morning was for his freelance work, the afternoon for his safe space app. For the life of me, I couldn't understand how he always broke into a sweat while coding. On the weekends, Ben met with another gay Southeast Asian man dedicated to fitness and tech. Vinny was helping with the development of Ben's app. He was Vietnamese. Our first encounter, I asked if his parents had hoped the alliteration of his name and his ethnicity would make it easier for him to assimilate. He laughed so hard that I regretted saying anything at all. Though Ben concluded that we the three of us would get along from then on out. This is gonna be fun, he said. Several times I watched Ben and Vinny code as I planned lessons about Ahab's inexorable hunt and Ishmael's never-ending musings. Waiting for Ben to stop working and slide his hand up my thigh. I wondered if the only thing that distinguished me from Vinny, that kept Ben's hand sliding up my thighs, was the fact that I was Cambodian. How easily could I be replaced by a different gay man who also happened to be Cambodian? Who could say? I listened to Ben and Vinny debate about memory issues and algorithms and recursion, observed their comfort in massaging each other's shoulders, and didn't care to know the answer to my question. What I did know was that Ben's safe space app unsettled me. I was offended by it, really, how it struck me as something I should want, something masquerading as objectively good, a solution to all our problems. It reminded me of the established curriculum for my human development class. It evoked for me the Lee Shore and Moby Dick, these supposed safe spaces in which we'd be forever bound, or even the white whale himself, that failed promise of closure. Ben wanted technology to offer people a sense of fulfillment, to rush them to shore, secure everyone to land, and I wanted to be indefinite, free to fuck off and be lost. Even so, Ben's genuine enthusiasm impressed me. He seemed not to care if he made money, only that his vision be fully realized. And he was so hyper-focused that I felt especially productive around him. Or was my strengthening drive to teach Moby Dick just a product of how stupid I thought Ben's app was? I was doing meaningful work, right? Changing the lives of the younger generation? Who knew? But in ways both tender and ugly, Ben allowed me, for once, to feel good about myself. Was that what drew Ishmael to Ahab? That he saw clearly how futile Ahab's mission was, how there was no world in which he could actually kill Moby Dick. Did he watch Ahab scream into the unconquerable face of the white whale so that his own life might have meaning? At the end of June, a month after Ben and I first hooked up, my sister texted me, it sounds like this relationship is pretty fucking serious. I responded, if it is it how it happened. She texted back, sorry I haven't been able to Skype. Shit's been crazy. It's okay, I texted. I'll find another Cambodian twin who also went to Stanford. She texted, lol. Tell Ben I want to meet him. I never asked Ben how serious he thought we were, as I felt apathetic about asserting any expectations onto our dynamic, but he did want to meet my sister. When he found out my twin had also attended Stanford, I almost thought he was suffering the rupture of a brain aneurysm. Jesus man, this is just so great, he said, 
recovering from the news, caressing my ass like a prized object. Your family is breaking new ground for Khmer folk, you know? Now the younger Cambos are gonna know it's freaking possible to get into a school like Stanford. I didn't feel like explaining to him that Stanford had allowed me to escape my hometown, my neighborhood, my Cambodian life. There was no point. Maybe you should meet my sister, I told him. Flattered, he interlaced his fingers into mine. Then he climbed on top of me, pushed my face deeper into the mattress, whispered something about how he couldn't help himself when he was around me. His dick rubbing against my lower back, he slipped his hands under my stomach, grabbing for my inner thighs, and spread my legs open, for once with neither concern nor apology. I surrendered to his body, and for a brief moment, I thought, why not? Maybe I could go on like this forever. I felt safe when I was pinned under him. Ben made me feel safe. Can I run some ideas by you? He asked the next morning, before launching into a 10-minute monologue about the pros and cons of the color teal as a method to optimize user engagement. On one hand, he started, wide-eyed, serious, it's calming and unique because it's not just a regular blue or green, and that's symbolic of safe spaces, right? They're supposed to be these special and unique, calming communities. On the other, do you think a more unique color, like, sacrifices the security of using a simple color everyone's accustomed to? There's a safety in familiar colors, right? And what am I doing if not trying to make people feel safe? I wouldn't exactly call teal unique, I said, curtly, looking down at my book. Oh, he said. Yeah. Maybe not. So what color should we use? Honestly, I don't think it matters, I said, not caring that he'd sounded hurt. Anyway, you should ask your partner, I added, with some spite, though he took this suggestion at face value. For the next hour, he proceeded to consult with Vinny, Vinny on the phone. And I pretended to read Moby Dick. On the 4th of July, Ben and I went to a picnic in Dolores Park, another Stanford affair, only this time hosted by a gay softball team. Ben was the one who had wanted to make an appearance. He kept calling it a networking opportunity. Dolores Park was packed and unreasonably warm for San Francisco. It seemed like the entire city was drinking beer and smoking pot on the grass desperate hipster trash, elitist marina snobs, vapid gay cliques, and so on. Do you also wish Dolores Park would fall into the ocean, Ben asked, nudging me in the ribs, or is it just the bridge you hate? We stepped through a cloud of smoke created by a group of teens in expensive-looking tie-dye shirts. He gripped my hand and dragged me into the dead hot center of Bay Area gentrification. I just wish it was less crowded, I said. If we keep bumping into sweaty shirtless guys, we're gonna get ringworms. Ben laughed and then immediately integrated himself with my Stanford peers. They played drinking games, threw footballs around dished about the latest gossip among VC firms. He tried to get me involved, but I told him I was too tired, that I was bored by all the talk of the future. I could see he was disappointed and I expected him to get mad, to snap on me for belittling his passion. The fact that he didn't felt like, like an intrinsic flaw in our relationship. A group of guys arrived with a beer pong table, and not long after that, Vinny popped up out of nowhere, forcing me into a hug. Sup guys, he said at large, so good-natured it vexed me. You invited Vinny? I whispered to Ben, almost hissing. Why not? He responded. He's gonna help me network. These are my friends, I wanted to say, though it struck me as false. Instead, claiming I needed to clear my head, I split off from them. For the first time in a month, I felt that Ben and I were untethered, and I walked around the park, sipping from a cup of straight vodka, until the idea of casual conversation stopped feeling alien. I thought of my sister, how she always knew exactly what she wanted at any given moment, down to a disturbing power to order off menus perfectly, and how it always been swept into her hunger for life. I thought about what I wanted to do now if I wanted to eat or leave the park, if I wanted to apply to grad school in the fall, if I wanted to find Ben in the crowd. Nothing sounded appealing, and I had the vague desire to slip through the cracks of what everyone else was doing. Then, not paying attention, I bumped into someone, literally, painfully, 
and fell over onto the grass. A burly hand picked me up, and I realized the man apologizing for knocking me over was the guy from the last party the one who'd witnessed himself get blocked, by me, on Grinder. Fuck, I'm sorry. He brushed the grass off of my shoulders, and I felt my muscles contract at his touch. I'm such a klutz spilling water over you, it's not cool at all. I shrugged. It's vodka. Wait, you're Annie's twin bro he said. Anthony, right? That's, that's me, I answered. Jake, he said, smiling, forcing me into a handshake. Damn, I like hardcore Miss Annie. She was a blast, you know? Yeah, she's a fucking asshole for leaving, I said, and he laughed. I guess it must be nice in some ways though, he said. Now you can be seen as, like, individuals, and not just twins, or whatever. You could see it like that, I responded. Look, I feel bad you're drenched. He patted my side to test the dampness. I felt nervous, animated, and then guilty at finding him so attractive. I couldn't help but feel drawn to his casual manners, the way he made the very act of being relaxed somehow noteworthy, as if answers simply manifested in his mouth while speaking plain and perfect. He seemed like the type of person who harbored no desire to prove anything, to be anything but himself. I looked around the crowd, tried locating Ben among the other bodies. What are you gonna do about it? I asked. My shirt. I live around the block. We could, um. Put your clothes in the wash. Let's go, I found myself saying, feeding off his easy energy. Where'd you go, Ben texted me. Sometime after Jake took off my clothes and swallowed me whole. Later, I came too early. Early, his dick still sliding in and out of my asshole. No longer intensely aroused, the bottom half of me went numb from the continued friction. It wasn't bad, the sex. It was almost nice to know I could find relief so quickly. After we finished, Jake left to check on my laundry. I texted Ben, I went to my apartment cause I felt sick. He texted, one of your friends is hooking me up with a VC connection. I texted, that's great. I saw several messages from my sister and ignored them. Despite myself, we continued on, like before, all through those remaining weeks of summer. And, despite myself, I kept sleeping with Jake, covertly and without permission. Ben and I even took a day hike through the Muir Woods at the end of July. I'd been telling him that I was taking long, solitary walks, that I needed fresh air to mull over Moby Dick passages, but really I was going over to Jake's. Eventually Ben grew to think I'd developed a passion for scenic strolls, then declared to me that I needed to witness the glorious redwoods. I wasn't against seeing the trees, but it was just that it all happened so fast, his planning, the departure, the drive. I barely had time to process any of it. Out of nowhere, he was buying us hiking shoes so our feet wouldn't blister. He packed enough healthy Cambodian food to feed a whole village. We spent the first hour of the hike in near silence. With his DSLR camera, Ben took high-resolution photos of every flourish of nature. Panting from the exertion, I was in a daze of bemused fascination at his endless curiosity with bark. At one point, a few butterflies stormed out of a bush, and Ben gasped in astonishment as he furiously snapped photos, his DSLR glued to his face. I had to admit, they were pretty cool. Once the butterflies cleared the area, he reviewed the shots he'd taken on the camera's mini HD screen, clicking the little buttons rapidly while squinting his eyes. Then his gaze ling lingered on a single photo. Rotating the camera, he examined the image at different angles. After that, he looked up and asked me, point blank, do you want kids? No, I answered, a bit thrown, not at all, actually. Really? How can you be so certain? Why are people always so skeptical about this? I responded. Fucking shit, I work with kids. I'm around them all the time. Yeah, but it's different, isn't it, when it's your own blood? He took a drink of the warm veggie stock in his industrial-grade thermos. Perfect, he'd claimed, for replenishing electrolytes. Don't you think we need to give the world more Khmer folk? 
He asked, and as he handed me his thermos, I suspected, faintly, that Ben seriously believed he could change my mind on things. Perhaps he even thought my desires were definite enough, pointed and graspable enough, to be overturned with the right levels of persistence. Maybe they were? That's part of my motivation, he added. Plus, I love kids. How noble of you, I said, declining the veggie stock. He slipped the thermos back into his bag, and I hoped he wouldn't take my refusal personally. I just didn't want to swallow something that hot in this heat. Shouldn't you have started making kids like yesterday? I asked, hands in my pockets. You're an old man, a daddy, after all. Probably, he said, and pulled me close. I couldn't stop laughing as he nibbled at my ear. I would have let him do that for hours, but the camera hanging from his neck was pressed between us, and I started to worry that it would break. For the rest of the hike, I reflected on the differences between Ben and Jake in bed, how Ben's touch felt warm, never-ending, so different from the crashing rush I inevitably had, later that night, with Jake. A week later, we were working at my regular coffee shop. Ben was pushing himself to finish his safe space app, having successfully networked his way into a pitch meeting with a big v VC firm. Nearing the end of his mission, he started to wax existential, the way so many of my Stanford classmates had done a week before graduating. I spent so much of my life not making much of anything, he suddenly said over his laptop, the screen reflecting off his reading glasses. He'd spent the past two hours coding, occasionally conferring with Vinny through a Bluetooth headpiece, never once looking up. Because you were in the closet for so long? I joked, closing my copy of Moby Dick. I'd been less than planning the chapter a squeeze of the hand, drafting summaries of how Ishmael reaches into a tub of sperm oil and squeezes, accidentally, but with elation, the hands of his crew members. I was trying to figure out a way to prevent my students from devolving into vulgar laughter, but it seemed like a lost cause, to think they could appreciate the tragic beauty of that brief, fleeting moment, of finding unexpected kinship through this opaque liquid, without someone cracking a cum joke. Ignoring me, Ben leaned forward, his whole face now catching the blue light. Anthony, I'm this close to achieving my goals? Goals, isn't that wild? Of course, this is making me realize a lot of freaking things. For example, we don't have the privilege of wasting time not anymore not with the stuff we've survived. Man, I wish, I really do, that I had someone in my life that told me how important it was for me for us to work hard. That's why you're making a safe space app. It's why I'm with you. He reached over his laptop, over the table, and grabbed my hands. It means something for us to be together. You know? I hope you realize that. Impulsively, I withdrew from his grasp. He looked hurt but didn't say anything, and before I could stop myself and pause, before I could even begin to understand why I wanted to yell at him for being weak, for making me feel weak I was leaving the table and heading for the bathroom, a knot of dread vibrating in my gut. Then I sat down on a toilet and thought of calling my sister, but had no desire to explain my feelings, nor did I care to hear about her life, so I stared at the posters pasted all over the stalls. The stickers saying Queers Hate T-E-C-H-I-E had been replaced with advertisements for a Google-sponsored event headlined by drag performers. I wondered if it was possible to resist something as immense as Google, if only for the sake of being uncertain. I did eventually talk to my sister about Ben, about Jake, about everything that night. She listened intently over the phone, providing the appropriate intermittent comments. She took no moral high ground. She wasn't frustrated that I had no idea, if I wanted to stay with Ben, that I kept joking about my standing in front of a luxury salon that specialized in grooming purebred dogs, which occupied the storefront next to Ben's apartment. The city's fucking doomed, I repeated. We're suffocating it with rich puppies. Just tell him the truth, she said, but if you really need it, I'll buy you a ticket to visit New York. By the weekend, after Ben had pitched his safe space app, I felt normal normal again. We were eating a late breakfast at his apartment brown rice and quinoa kanji, pickled mustard greens sautéed with ground turkey, hard-boiled tea eggs, but with the yolks thrown out to preserve our cholesterol levels. By the way, I invited Vinny over for dinner, Ben said, staring into his bowl. 
For days, he'd been anxious about the results of his pitch meeting. I promised him a home-cooked meal, he continued. To celebrate, you know, finishing the app. That's fine, I said, even though a wave of discontent was lapping its way over me. Suddenly, I wanted to hurt Ben, to provoke him into finally snapping on me the way I surely deserved. Then my sister's advice came back to me. I've been fucking a guy since 4th of July, I said, mushy rice dripping out of my mouth. I had no end goal in mind for this confession. Ben dropped his spoon. Eyebrows pushed together, he stared at me as if trying to figure out if I was joking. I thought I should tell you, I added, deciding right then to omit the fact of Jake's whiteness. In his expression, I saw Ben register the reality of my words. He crossed his arms, leaning against the back of his chair. I guess, he said, we never did have a serious discussion about, you know, us. I waited for him to keep talking, even as I felt terrible for not saying anything, for keeping him suspended in my confession. After a moment, I started eating again, though I could no longer taste the food. I began to regret the past few weeks, all the moments of intimacy Ben, and I had shared intimacy that extended beyond the confines of sex itself. This felt, in retrospect, like the cruelest thing I'd done to Ben, letting him think that nothing was wrong, that I was willing to overlook any problems we may have had. We can be open if you want, he finally said, and clasped his hands together on the table, as if offering me a stock option package. I just. If you want to have see other guys, I can be flexible with that. But I believe we should. Work a, a little harder at this. Staying together. Bitterness pulsed through me. Stop that. Stop what? Making it seem like we have to be together, like it's our fucking duty. What are you talking about? He made a face as if he'd changed his mind about something. What do you even want from me, Anthony? I looked at him angrily, offended, only to realize how reasonable the question was. I just think we want different things, I said, ashamed that I had nothing concrete to offer. I guess I want to live in a world where every action doesn't need to get us somewhere. And you? You want to be impactful, always. What about the book you're teaching, he said, the defiance in his voice sliding into desperation. I mean, look, we both have ambitions. We both care about things. He threw his arms out in exasperation. Why are we even talking about this? What does it have to do with you fucking a... I can't be with a Cambodian guy just to be with a Cambodian guy. Slowly, Ben's face dropped at the words I spit out, the words that rushed out of me in single steam of sounds. He looked down at his stomach, shaking his head. For the first time in weeks, I noticed how much older he was than me the fatigue deepening the circles around his eyes, the laugh lines accenting his mouth. I had started the exact conversation I wanted to avoid. I'm sorry, I continued. It's not about you, specifically, or even Cambodian people. It's, like, a moral thing. He sighed and turned away from me, grimacing in the direction of the window. We don't have it like that, do we? None of us can afford to be moral. Maybe moral isn't the right word for it. I don't think you realize how much we owe each other, he said, his voice now diminishing to a whisper, as though his power source were about to die. Standing up, he started to gather our half-empty plates. Are you done? I nodded, handing him my bowl. I do realize I mean, I know our history, I said, but he was already walking to the kitchen sink, and this last excuse of mine could only fall against his back. That afternoon we stayed in bed, not quite knowing what to do, where to go, if we should keep talking about our relationship or just give it a rest. After a couple of hours, we started kissing, our hands reaching into each other's pants, but we progressed no further than that. It felt impossible to leave our current state of dissonance. We were still in bed when Ben's phone went off in the early evening. He left the room, and I could hear him mutter choppy sentences. Ten minutes later, he returned looking pale-faced, giddy yet terrified. I just... I just got 500,000 in VC funding. Holy shit, I said in disbelief. That's great, right? It's more than I ever imagined. 
We should, like, do something. He stuttered incomprehensibly, his brain undergoing some sort of information overload. Yeah, sure, we should. He finally got out, before he shut his eyes, centered himself back into his body. Shit, he said suddenly. Vinny's coming over. He looked at his phone, then at me, then back at his phone, and so on. I'll cancel. No, don't. I smiled. This is a big deal. For Vinny, too. We should have fun. Vinny arrived an hour later, and we told him the news, which prompted him to holler so loudly, I was sure Ben's neighbors would file a noise complaint. In all the excitement, one thing led to another, another, and the three of us found ourselves on the bed, buzzed from white wine and talk of the future. You guys are gonna revolutionize safe spaces, I said, genuinely, hot from the alcohol, and both of them laughed. Then I kissed Ben while stroking Vinny's thigh. And then I surprised myself by kissing Vinny. When I unlocked my mouth from Vinny's, I glanced over at Ben, who seemed at once confused and enthralled. It's okay, I assured him, biting his ear softly and pulling Vinny closer to us. Soon each of us was devouring another part of someone else. My heart was beating so fast I swore it was the sole audible thing in the room. We took turns in each position, in each role, to the point that we became interchangeable, mere parts of an improved system of fucking. I experienced such intense moments of pleasure I could barely breathe, and the only thing preventing me from passing out, from gasping for air, was looking at Ben, our eyes locking every few moments, even as we were both intertwined with Vinny's perfect, sculpted body. For the duration of our three-way, I saw the possibility of existing in a dynamic in which every pleasure received, every favor granted, every dick sucked, every bottom filled and every top gratified, could energize you to give back more than what you had in the first place. I saw clearly Ben's ideal vision of the world, a way of being that could sustain communities, protect safe spaces, and ensure that political progress kept happening. I felt euphoric, high, blood rushing to my head. I felt unbearably hopeful. Then we started to unravel, our mouths tired from sucking, our asses by now chafed and sore. Our dicks ached, our wrists gave out. We came. We finished. We detached ourselves from our positions, collapsed onto the bed, and returned to our bodies as three different men, each of us exhausted from all this pleasure. That was intense, Ben said to the ceiling. Hell yeah, Vinny responded, and sprang up from between us. Us his hands touching both of our thighs. Ben, let's hire Anthony to work for the startup. Ben laughed. Be more specific. A safe space tech company led by an all, Southeast Asian team? I mean, how awesome would that be? We'd be profiled by Forbes, Business Insider, maybe freaking GQ. Think about it. Our headline could read from refugees to Silicon Valley, the American dream. What would I even do? I asked. I don't know, man, Vinny answered. You can write the instructions and copy for the interface, or shoot, be the head of HR. I'll need to consider all the qualified candidates, Ben said, flicking my ears. Vinny jumped to his feet and slapped his stomach. We can talk salaries over food. There's a new sushi bar on Valencia. Sounds good, Ben said. He sat up and motioned for us to leave. But I shook my head. Anthony, he said, softly. Come. Don't worry about me, I'll be here. I rose and rested my head on Ben's shoulder. I just need. To think, I whispered into his neck. Disappointed, depleted I could tell he wrapped his arm around me. He kissed my forehead, leaving his lips connected to my skin and we lingered in this position, in silence, as Vinny went to the bathroom. Ben's breathing remained steady, deep, strong. I closed my eyes, listening to its rhythm. I felt it resounding through his chest, and also into mine. After the two of THE Mad showered and set off to the mission, I drifted, naked and covered in cum, to the living room. Utterly alone but at peace, I looked out of the window, taking in the lights of the Bay Bridge, until every ounce of my former impressions had fallen away, or had maybe faded, or dissolved, into the depths of my mind. 
That fight between me and Ben appeared so distant now, as if it had occurred ages, ages ago, before we had even met. Then I put on my clothes, gathered my copy of Moby Dick, my keys, my wallet, and made my way to the Embarcadero station. The process of catching the N-train struck me as surprisingly seamless, despite my phone having died in my pocket. I had forgotten how easy it was to return home. Summer break was about to end, and it was senselessly cold, as San Francisco always got in August. In a couple of weeks, I would begin my second year as a teacher. My workdays would resume. Watching the hilly streets of Victorians pass me by, I thought of my lesson for the first day of school. Even though I still planned on teaching Moby Dick, I would pose the same question I'd started last semester with, what's the point of this class? I remembered my old students' answers, their tentative convictions, their stabs of belief that all knowledge might be reduced to dumb platitudes. We're learning how to be citizens, they tried. Everyone needs to be socially engaged. Everything is political. The train came to my stop, so I stepped off and started walking. A dense fog from the ocean had crawled through the neighborhood, pulled in by the valley heat of my childhood and Ben's prior life. I couldn't see far ahead, but I knew where I was going, and I was reminded of Ishmael working on the masthead of the Pequod, Ishmael dozing to the cadence of his dazed reflections, diffused into the clear sky, the total opposite of my current waking moment. As I waded through the fog, I wondered, then, at the impossibility of my existence. Here I was. Living in a district that echoed a dead San Francisco. Gay, Cambodian, and not even 26, carrying in my body the aftermath of war, genocide, colonialism. And yet, my task was to teach kids a decade younger, existing across an oceanic difference, what it meant to be human. How absurd, I admitted. How fucking hilarious. I was actually excited. <laughs>